Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video. Enjoying another of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic outlines 10 practical benefits of the Holy Spirit's work in us. He's really our best friend on earth. Jesus called him the promise of the Father. He's described as a comforter of the same kind as the Savior himself. He was the secret of the church's power and joy and faithfulness in New Testament days. Maybe it's time to remind ourselves what the Spirit wants to do in and for us. So let's get started. Number one, he births us and immediately indwells us. That's right. John 3, 5 to 8 tells us that we are born of the Spirit of God. And secondly, that he comes to indwell us. The Lord said on the great day of the feast, Is anyone thirsty? Come to me and drink. And if you do, not only will you be satisfied, but out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit actually flows out of the believer. And it's a remarkable picture that's being given there. So what this practically reminds us is that not only do we have God's life in us, but we actually have God himself. The third person of the Trinity has moved into the believer and actually resides within us. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two, he has baptized us into the one body and we drink into him. Now, this is an interesting double picture there in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. And uh, we can illustrate it perhaps with a shell in the ocean and the ocean in the shell. Not all of the ocean is in the shell, but all of the shell is in the ocean. And so the Holy Spirit is in me and I am in the Spirit. And this word baptize was a bit of a cop-out by the members of the church who translated it because they didn't practice what baptism actually means, which is immersion. And it was used for dyeing cloth. You put it right under. You didn't sprinkle something on it. You put it right under. And the idea is that we're immersed in the Holy Spirit. And this is beautifully illustrated in the holy anointing oil where you had different kinds of spices, the cinnamon and calabas and so on, it was put into the apothecary's bowl, and then the holy oil was poured on it, the olive oil, and it all of a sudden became one. Now, each of the uh, spices still contributed to the perfume, but they now were one by the holy oil. And so each of us has individuality and personality, and yet now we have become one by the Holy Spirit who has baptized us into the body of Christ. Number three, he seals us. Yes, that's Ephesians 1.13. And uh, we read that he seals us till the day of redemption. That's not the day that we're saved from the penalty of sin. That's the day we're saved from the presence of sin, the final act of redemption what's called the redemption of the body when we're actually taken home to heaven. So the Lord Jesus has moved in uh, in the person of the Holy Spirit and he has guaranteed he will not leave us until he gets us safely home. So the emphasis is on security and on ownership. When the Roman seal was placed on the tomb of the Lord Jesus, the idea was it's not going to open. This is the official seal of the Roman Empire. We have the right to give this, uh, to take this authority. Of course, man's authority is, is ephemeral, but the authority of Christ is absolute. And so he has put his seal upon us, which cannot be broken. The Holy Spirit gives us that sense of security and safety because we are sealed by him. And number four, he empowers us to live a victorious life. 
All the way through the book of Acts, we see the power of the Spirit working through the people of God. And we notice in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord had said to the disciples, even though they had had the ideal Bible training program for three years with the Lord Jesus himself, he said, don't you even think of leaving Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we should take the same attitude that if the Spirit of God is not active in our lives and doesn't have the control and the power to motivate us and direct us and utilize us, we're better not getting involved. We need the Spirit of God to do the work of God in a spiritual way. And that's what the church had all the way through the book of Acts. And then number five, he intercedes in our hearts. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. The Romans 8 tells us that we have two intercessors. We're well looked after. We have an intercessor in the heavens, Christ, who is looking after our interests with God. And then we have an intercessor in the heart. That's the Holy Spirit who's looking after God's interests in us. And so the Holy Spirit actually helps us to pray. He moves us to pray. He uh, translates our prayers when we don't even know what to pray. The Spirit of God can take those groanings and turn them into a prayer that exactly matches the will of God. I dare say someday we'll get home and God will say, would you like to see what I did with that prayer you prayed? I say, Lord, I don't even remember praying that. He said, well, I knew you had a longing and I fulfilled the longing even though you didn't know how to ask for it. And that's the work of the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit of God prompts us to pray brings before us from the Word of God the things that we need to pray about, opens our eyes to see need around us. We couldn't survive in our prayer life if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. And that gives us uh, comfort in, in praying as well as uh, it reveals our necessity yeah. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, on Him. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah, yeah. In prayer. Our prayers get to heaven in the revised version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, number six, he gave us the Bible and teaches it to us. Holy man of God, moved by the Holy Spirit, were able to write the scriptures. Now there are three great miracles here. Revelation, the truth coming from the mind of God into our little minds, the minds of men. It's a wonder that the thoughts of God didn't blow our transformers, but God was able to communicate it to us. That's revelation. And then inspiration is the means by which the Spirit of God worked through the life experiences, the personalities, the vocabularies of different men, holy men, so that we have the very Word of God, but in all different styles of communication. And then thirdly, there is illumination. This is the process by which the truth of God comes off the page of Scripture and comes into our hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit. So he was involved in all three stages, bringing the truth to holy men, allowing them to be the instruments of writing the Bible, and then taking the truth and bringing it back full circle into our hearts. And in all three cases, the Spirit is essential. And then number seven, he raises up spiritual guides for us and leads us. Yes, in Acts 20, 28, we discover that the Holy Spirit makes overseers. We can't uh, buy elders, so we can't rent them. They have to be grown. And it's the Holy Spirit who works in the hearts and raises up men, gives them a burden for the people of God so that the church is cared for by these overseers, these under-shepherds, and it's the Holy Spirit who does that. Not only does he do that with these men, who are overseers, but he does it individually with us. He gives us personal guidance so that we can know how we ought to walk and the decisions that we ought to, ought to make for the glory of God. And then going along with that, number eight, he grows Christ-like fruit in our lives. Yes, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. We see it in contrast to the works of the flesh. Anything that I try to do independently of the Spirit turns out badly. But when I yield to the Spirit of God, He actually produces this fruit in our lives. And when we look at the characteristics, the ninefold 
characteristics of that fruit, it sure looks like Jesus. So if we make room for the Spirit in our hearts, He'll make room for the Lord Jesus. Number nine, He equips God's people with gifts. Right, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that the Holy Spirit gives as He wishes to each believer, and every one of us receives a gift from the Holy Spirit the moment we're saved. Now we need to stir up that gift and develop that gift, but the Holy Spirit knows the gifts that are needed and he provides each of us with that gift. So it's important for us to uh, take that seriously. This supernatural ability that the world can't imitate. It's different than a talent. I can share a talent with an unbeliever, the ability to sing well or speak well, but the gifts that are given here are supernatural gifts that worldlings cannot do. They need special supernatural insights and powers and, uh, and tools in order to accomplish them. And it's the Spirit of God who does that. So that means, practically, that every time I enjoy the ministry of another Christian, I have the Holy Spirit to thank for that. And by encouraging that person, I have a part in their gift. I can't do all the gifts, but by encouragement, I can have an investment in every gift. And the Holy Spirit is pleased when I recognize His sourcing of these gifts to enrich the church. And then number 10, he both comforts and convicts us. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. He comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. So the idea, I, I think this is absolutely crucial in our understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have two warnings. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, don't grieve the Spirit. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, don't quench the Spirit. Grieving the Spirit is saying yes to what the Spirit says no to. The Spirit says don't do that, and I go ahead and do it. I grieve the Spirit. Never forget, the Spirit is a person. He's not a force. He's a person, and we grieve Him. He has agreed. I mean, we think of how the Lord Jesus came graciously to live for 33 years in a sinful world. But the Holy Spirit has come to live 2,000 years in a sinful church. Imagine what it would be like if you came to my house for dinner and I hogtied you and threw you in the trunk and took you to see some foul movie and forced your eyes open so you had to watch it. You could hardly expect to receive a little note in the guest book, thanks for the lovely evening. It's a double date everywhere I go. The Holy Spirit goes with me. Do I subject him to attitudes? Uh, ways of speaking, habits that are grievous to him, to the Holy Spirit. If I'm going to be used by God in a significant way, I've got to take this seriously. And the scripture says, don't grieve him. That is, when he says no to something, you say, yes, sir, and you agree with him. Otherwise, he's grieved. And then secondly, don't quench him. When he tries to start a fire in us to do something for God, and we psh, put the fire out, we quench the Spirit of God. And so it's either if we say yes to what he says no to, that's grieving. If we say no to what he says yes to, that's quenching. And so he wants to comfort us, but he sometimes has to convict us. And if we're paying attention to the Holy Spirit of God, he'll keep us on the straight and narrow. Good idea to respond quickly to the Spirit and not hang on to our own ways grieving him, quenching him, and neutralizing ourselves from being used by God. So thank God for the Holy Spirit. We owe so much to the ministry of this third person of the Trinity. Let's cooperate with him. Let's not get in his way and see the fullness and fruit and power and joy of the Spirit in our lives that we can see recorded in the story of the early church. <laughs>